Welcome to the Rose of Sharon radio broadcast, where you are destined to smell the sweet aroma of the truth in accordance with Ephesians 4.15, guaranteed to make you free to lead the abundant life till it overflows. The time is now and the person is you. So sit back, relax, grab your Bible, some paper and a pen, as we welcome our host, Sharon Green. Good evening, everyone. This is Sharon Green, and yes, you are listening to the Rose of Sharon Show on the Survival Radio Christian Network. Thank you for joining me on this evening. I'm excited like I always am because I just love, I truly love sharing the Word of God as much as I love learning from you as well. But I'm coming to you tonight from sunny Florida, although it's nighttime here. But hanging out in Orlando at an awesome, wonderful, fabulous leadership conference. But before I even go there, I want to welcome all you new people who are listening in for the first time. This show is completely dedicated and committed to and built upon and represents Ephesians 4 and 15 where we speak the truth in love that we may grow up. Grow up in all things into him who is the head, and that is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. It's nothing like being on top, and we get to represent the best because we are the called out, blood washed, fire baptized children of the Most High God. And why is that important? Because 1 John 4 and 17 tells us that love has been perfected among us, that we may come boldly on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we. That is no longer a slogan. That is not just something that we say. That is something that has to be manifested and realized and believed throughout the body of Christ. It is time for us to take our right position. It's time for us to know who we are. And most importantly, it's definitely time for us to know whose we are because you died. You died upon salvation. You gave up life. You told the Father that you wanted to represent his son. You wanted to be a part of the body of Christ. You gave up all rights and authorities, and you said that I will be led by your spirit. I will allow you to give me the provisions and the vision to go forth in life that you may be made large in the earth through me. So it's time to die, and it's time to grow up in all things and to him who is the head, because that is your assignment in life. And when you get that part straight, everything, every area of your life falls into its proper place as his workmanship, created for good works that he prepared beforehand. So you are not a surprise to God. Your problems are not a surprise to them either. That's why I often say the Bible is full of bailouts, bailout scriptures, because he knew that we were going to have issues believing. He made it so simple, and all he told us to do is to believe. So on tonight, we're going to continue on fighting the good fight of faith, because that's what we do. As Christians, that's what we do. So we don't fight like the world. We have our own way of representing God his way. He's already given us everything pertaining to life and godliness is already on the inside of you. You are fully equipped. And so since we know that, we have to know how to actually live life as Jesus Christ in the earth. Ironically, on today, you know, I'm at a John Maxwell training event. I'm on his mentorship team. And so we come together twice a year. Well, I come once, but we come together twice a year and have the opportunity to just be in the room, be with John, and get different points and principles. And he always asking questions, always extend, expanding our level of thinking, always pressing us to go deeper and stop being surface thinkers. And so I love that. I love that. But on today we had the opportunity to watch the movie Braveheart. And that's one thing we do. We did Lincoln before. Now this time it's Braveheart. So you basically break down the movie as far as the leadership principles. And I said, well, wait a minute. Okay, I happen to be watching a movie about fighting. 
How ironic. Watch the movie about fighting, and it's talking about the leadership principles behind the different leaders. What were their angles as far as even fighting? Why were they doing what they do? What were their connections? What were their relationships? And so I'm asking you tonight the same thing. As you fight the good fight of faith, what angle are you taking? What is your approach? What are your your relationships? Why do you do the things that you do? Why do you not see God alive and living in your life to such a degree that everything in your life resonates peace? It resonates joy. It's sweatless victory. You have good days every day. Your heart is happy. You're a merry person. The people around you are prosperous. And life is good. And so you don't see that. If you don't if you can't say that, then you have to know that this ain't God. We have to know that. You have to look around and not think it, you know, just some things we have to go through. Because when you hang out with leaders, I will tell you, it's it's a wonderful thing because I always say John is what my man of God back in Maryland is, Pastor Michael Freeman is. The Lord has called him to unify the body. If Jesus can pray pray three times in John 17 that we be one, that he and the Father is one, unity is a big deal with God. Anybody who's selfless serving and bringing people together, uniting them on one purpose, being on one accord, that's big with God. John have people, we have people, leaders from here, from all over the world. They fly in here religiously. They went to Guatemala. They flew all the way to Guatemala just to be a part, just to be on the team. Everybody left their denominations at the door. Everybody left their religious backgrounds or lack thereof at the door. Hundreds of people went to the altar this morning to give their lives to the Lord because one man decided that I'm going to leave a legacy. I'm going to teach people how to teach people so that the people that you teach can multiply more leadership in the earth to make right decisions for the right reasons so that we can grow and be on one accord. And so my man and God get to do it in the body of Christ, to bring the churches together, because there's no denominations in the Bible. He never called us to, to separation. And so unless we start seeing this and speaking about it and being about the things of the kingdom and the earth, we're going to continue to live a life with an excuse. Well, I'm one person, I'll stand alone. I don't give a darn. I will stand by myself. If it don't line up with the word, if it don't line up with his will, I'm not the one. I'm not your girl. I'm not buying it. I could care less about who says what. If it don't line up with this word, then it's not real to me. It's a lie. I don't do lies. People die because of lies. Life is really horrible because of lies. A little lie is a lie. Our father is not the the author of lies. He said he hates lies. Satan is the father of lies. And so if it's not the truth, it's a lie. And the truth is the only thing that's going to make us free. So that's why I don't mind speaking it. At any time, on any occasion, it's okay. I'll just stand by myself. And lately, I know that this thing is going to get bigger, way bigger than me. Way, 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 way bigger than me. And so just being here this week, and I'm like, okay, so now who do I know or don't know, I don't have to know you, to know that this dispensation in time is evolving. It's evolving, and there's nothing that one person can do alone. I'm not trying to build no team like John Maxwell's team. I know that, but I'm trying to be in the presence of people who truly believe the word, who can help manifest new thoughts, have visions, have revelation services, stop the testimony services. Stop all of that. Stop talking about you. When you talk about Jesus, you get revelation. You get understanding, and you know that these things that don't look like God are not from him, and therefore they get no time, no effort, no excuse. You just know it's out of order. So as we almost let me focus, let me focus, let me focus. (laughs) As we fight the good fight of faith, that is our assignment, to fight the good fight of faith. And the first step, I think we, I don't know, I talked about a lot last week too. But the first very step is to know who you are. Because you, when you know who you are, when you know who you are, you don't fight no way. Nobody in the body of Christ fights. What are we going to fight for? We got angels that fight for us. They're on assignment. We, we speak the word of God, they hear us speaking it, and they go out, they set out. 
We've already been shielded. The Lord is our shield. And so if he has shield around you, why do you have so much infiltration? Nobody's getting past God to get to you. Nobody's getting past the angel of the Lord that surrounds those who fear God. Nobody's just getting in there. So if, if everything in your world is falling apart, you are contributing to your own demise. And once you recognize that, because when you know who you are and you recognize you recognize that this right here is not my father is when you will really start to say and do something about it. And, yes, for those of you who may be listening for scriptures and all of that, I'm going to go there. But that's one revelation that I've got is, Lord, what in the world are we doing wrong? We have the same stuff week after week. Everybody going to church, nobody truly growing up. It doesn't take much. I don't care how long you've been in church. I can have a conversation with you, and in a minute I'll know whether or not you've grown because your mouth will be a reflection of what's in your heart, and your heart does not lie. It'll tell anybody where you're at as far as your spiritual walk. It does not take long. Matter of fact, it's a, one of the biggest churches in my area in Maryland where I live. I, I kid you not. It's one of the biggest churches in the area, and to this day, I have never met anyone from that church that's mature, not one person. If I was to start a conversation with them about how we're the healed of Jesus Christ and sickness is a curse, I would get the same, but what about this? Well, what about this person? Well, what about this? Well, you know God allowed it. You know God allowed it. The same stuff. Why is what you want to defend a curse? Why is it okay? Why why is it okay to be okay with the curse? What's going on in your mind that won't allow you to recognize Eden? If no place else, go to Eden. Well, there's no sickness in Eden. Ain't no sickness in the body of Christ. When you set your mind on things above, you get thoughts about things above, where there's happy and joy and peace. Love is overwhelming. You have those thoughts when you set your mind on things above. And so we, I don't know, I just, I'm, I'm totally opposite. I know I'm peculiar. I just don't understand why we would want to defend the lie. But we will defend the lie tooth and nail. We'll look to people. We'll use their, their situations. We'll use our own lives like we die for one another. You ain't died for me. And, and I'm pretty sure I probably wouldn't die for you now. I'm not going to lie about that. So you can't even look to me. I'm not your source. The word is in the word that you need for your solution is in the Bible. And once you meditate on it, it will be inside of you. Because we have to stop looking at the Bible like that's God. He created you to be him. So the more you meditate and get that word in your heart, it evolves. You soon become the word, a speaking spirit representing Christ in the flesh. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's his plan for your life, not to have a book that you go to and you worship a book more than you do what's on the inside of you. And so we have to fix that. And so though, I, let me go back to the scripture. Okay, I, I'm going to get to the scripture part. But as I saw God on what are we doing wrong, why are we not growing up, why do we have so many babies, got all these people in leadership positions that's running around here like a bunch of punks. Excuse my language, but most pastors wouldn't make it in the military. They would get their tail whooped by the soldiers because they always want to give an excuse for somebody who can't get it and they falling apart and, you know, we just got to meet them where they at. No, Jesus went out into the world. He went out with the people. He did. I get that. He was with them. Show me where he sat there and talked to them about their problems. He didn't come down to talk to them and remind them that they was getting their tail whooped, and they didn't even have Holy Spirit. He didn't sit there to talk about them, about their problems, and make them feel good about having a problem. He showed them the Father through his life. He showed them hope through his words and his actions opening blinded eyes, laying hands on the sick, calling the, causing the dead to come back alive. He showed life to them, and they sought after him. So that's one big problem. We don't show life. We show words. We show other people. We quote people like they're God themselves. We look to people more than we do to the word God. So we have to fix that because fighting is not a little sissy thing that you do. 
You don't fight like the world do. We don't ball up our fists, go get guns and knives. That's not how we fight. Fighting is having a Holy Spirit conviction that the word is true, that my Father loves me, that I'm created to represent him. Fighting is speaking his words, putting him in remembrance of what he said about you, what he said about what he's already prepared for you in advance. Fighting is knowing that is unity in the body of Christ, and we can get more done in the earth, unified and on one accord, so that the world will see our good works and glorify God. Right now, we do so much fighting against each other. The world don't know Christ from Buddha, from all the other people. Hear the Christian? No, they don't. They confused. They're confused because nothing about us is unified. And when I say us, for the people that are listening in, I'm talking about the body of Christ. Thank God you are more mature. I may not be talking about you specifically, but who are you helping to make sure I'm not talking about them? Who is in your life that your light is shining so brightly that you're wise because they chose Christ because they had an experience with you? So those are the questions you have to ask yourself because sitting at home taking care of your family, that's old. Jesus didn't even come here to keep the family together. And so you got to recognize that, too. What are you doing to reach the world that's outside of your own home, that's outside of your own neighborhood? What is it? What legacy are you leaving behind because you chose to believe? Not because you did something. You chose to believe. And then the believing causes you to receive, causes you to love. The love causes you to do. Doing is sweatless. It's a part of your life. And so fighting, you have to know who you are and what you have and whose you are and what you possess. I think I started off with for what, first, second Peter 1 and 3. Let me go there. I'm going to slow down and go to the scriptures. Yes, me. I'm going to the scriptures. <laughs> I know that shouldn't be funny, but that's another thing. We teach the word like we're in school. Yes, I know you would call it school, but it's not school. You, your life is changing. You're not trying to learn information. You're trying to become the information that you're receiving. There's a difference. The word is spirit. Spirit gives life to spirit. It does not give life to your flesh. It gives life to spirit. And so long as we're in an environment where I'm trying to make you feel good about being there, we're going to continue to have babies running around here. And then we won't see the life that Jesus died for us to have. So I personally, I think that's an insult, that somebody would die for me and then I don't even believe to actually do the things that I said I wanted to do. Because nobody made me be a Christian. Like, nobody made you be a Christian. You chose to be a Christian. <laughs> so since so you chose to be a Christian, it comes with some responsibility. And some of that responsibility, well, that responsibility is called grow up, and all things into him. So I'm not trying to offend anybody. This is love in your face. <laughs> and if you guys don't have nobody around you that will tell you the truth, you need to get some new friends. Get away from them people who just want you to feel good. No, I'm not trying to make you feel bad, but once you get past that stage of how you feel into who I am and who I am and making him look bigger and brighter through your life, get nobody to offend you. Because you know that you have to take an offense. I can't offend you, and I'm not trying to offend you. I'm, I'm just at a point in my life where the excuses just kind of bother me. They, they I'm physically, like, they get on my nerves. Like, if I hear another Christian excuse, I'm literally ready to jump out of my seat in the middle of church and just tackle somebody. <laughs> so get that on YouTube, because I'm not saying that it won't happen. Somebody got to be able to stand up and say, no, it's time to grow up. Perfection in Christ is just that, perfect. So regardless of whether you see it, taste it, touch it, smell it, or hear it, it exists. You are in the body of Christ. All your issues and concerns, those are outside. And that's a choice that you have made when you have been given the privilege to represent Jesus Christ himself. But over in Second Peter 1, I'm going to start at verse 2. I'm going to start at verse 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. As his divine power has given to us, has given to us, not going to give, not in the great by and by, has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who calls us by glory and virtue. So he has given us all things pertaining to life, eternal life, being alive, being the light and godliness, God's way of doing what he does. He's he's given it to us. We know how to live life the way that he does it. But it's through the knowledge of Jesus. If you don't know nothing about him, if you don't know his personality, if you don't know Jesus was not a punk, if you don't know that, then you'll think that it is okay. You know, people come to church late because, you know, they got things to do. They just, it's okay. They don't have to come to praise and worship because they don't realize that, you know, that's really through God. It's not to people. So it's okay. They'll, they'll get there one day. Yeah, he was nothing like that. He was like, look, if you want to drink, what he said, drink this, drink this blood or drink this whatever, he told the people, if you don't want to go with me, then leave. And then after they left, many left. And this John said, many left. He told us the, the, the disciples, y'all want to go too? <laughs> he didn't play. He was about his father's business. Love him. But you have everything that you need for life, that you need for God. It's already on the inside of you. Now, if you go with me over to Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1. And three. Hold up just a minute. Ephesians one and three says I'm trying not to read by memory today. Hold up. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Bless us, blessed us, past ten has given to us, past tense, with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. We are his beloved. He so loved us. He adopted us to him long before we chose to be as he is. He made us his sons. He predestined that we would choose him. I know it's still a choice. He can't make you do anything. You have to make the choice. But he already set it up because he knew the end at the beginning. He set it up. He gave us the choice. He gave us the provision. He said, I'm going to give you life. You have to take it by faith. That's why it's a fight, because we have to take it by faith. The enemy knows what's in store for us. He can see it. He's in the spirit. He want to make sure we don't know. He was with God. They hung out together. He knows what's in store for us, those who believe. He knows that. So he's given us every spiritual blessing. Every good thing is already on the inside of you. And it's up to you to manifest it through faith, through the word, through believing and receiving it in your heart, speaking it out your mouth, serving others, loving others, most importantly, loving God. If you love me, you'll keep my commands. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love. Everything hangs on love. Jesus was the fulfillment of love. And so he gave us the same traits. He set us up for nothing but victory. So when the praises go up, the blessings don't come down. <laughs> no, you already have them. You already have them. And so it's different when you have something. When you recognize that you have it, you're no longer walking around asking God for it. And when you know the Holy Spirit dwells on the inside of you, you'll stop telling them to come on in, take a seat. You'll stop doing that <laughs> because you know he's right there. You'll stop telling them when he shows up. You'll, you won't say that because you know that he's 
It's with you. And so when you have revelation of that, even your worship goes to three dimensions because you recognize that God is always with me. So if I'm singing to him, about him, why am I calling him him? <laughs> I'm talking to the Father, and I'm calling him him, and he, like he ain't there. That's because you've been trained to sing to people about God instead of singing to him or talking to him about him, honoring him, thinking about him, loving him. That's true worship of your heart from you, your spirit longing for him. And so let me keep it moving, let me keep it moving. Romans 12 and 3, let's go there next. Because you're equipped, you want to add somebody. And so regardless of what it looks like, whatever state your life may be in, on this day, you can call the and suddenly. And suddenly I got a word. And suddenly I believe. And there's nothing better than and suddenly. And suddenly, oh, he loves me. When you recognize that God loves you, life just mm, take on a different level of love. When, when you know God loves you, you don't have those fear. You won't, you won't even have fear. How do you have fear when you know he loves you? When, especially when you know he's your protection. When you know that he's already sent his, his only son, he sent himself literally to die for you to have life. Why would you choose anything else? Okay, Romans 12 and 3. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one. King James says, the measure of faith. I'm going to stick with that one, not a measure. Because it was a measure. He could have gave us all different measures. He is no respect of person. He does not show favoritism. He gave us the measure. We all start off with faith. We have faith, and it's up to us to work the faith. We work the faith by believing his word, by seeing the end at the beginning, by diligently guarding your heart. When you diligently guard your heart and you diligently add to your faith over in Second Peter, or I started, just diligently add to your faith virtue and knowledge and self-control and perseverance and, to, and perseverance godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness love. And then it says, it goes on to say, because if you don't, you're nearsighted. You forgot that you were saved. It says those who diligently add these virtues shall never stumble. See, I like stuff like that. I'm all over it. Never stumble. Okay, how do I get that? Never stumble. Never stumble. Psalm 119, 165. It says, they who love the law, so get great peace do they have who love the law. And nothing should cause them to stumble. So that's like, wow, nothing should cause them to stumble. But what about such and such? What about this person? You know, what about this? No, no, I don't care about this or them or who that is. The Bible tells me it should, I should not be stumbling. If I love his word, if it's in my heart, if I'm meditating on it, if I'm giving him praise and glory, if he is leading me, because the Holy Spirit will never, ever lead you into anything that's not good and not perfect. So if it's not good and it's not perfect, it's probably you taking a stroll outside of the body of Christ, outside of your divine protection, and clearly outside of your assignment in him. And so as we continue to grow in all things into him who is the head, we're going to get ready to go to commercial. We're going to come back, and we're going to continue to understand how to fight. We haven't even started fighting yet. We're just working on you knowing who you are. Because when you know who you are, you'll go into battle with vehicles without doors. I mean, that was kind of arrogant of the United States to go to war in a land with vehicles that don't have doors on them. So, you know, we had a little sense of pride in who we are and what we represent and how well equipped we are because we are. Our military is very well prepared, very well equipped to fight. But you, ladies and gentlemen, you got more arsenal on the inside of you than any <laughs> any military in the whole world. Because you don't have to fight. Because you fight from victory. You're not trying to defend yourself. You've already won. That's why you're more than a conqueror. That's why you're an overcomer. That's why you're a victorious. 
And that's why he always leads you into triumph, regardless of what it looks like. And when you know that, you know your situations and circumstances are only temporary. But when you really know that you're adding to it, you'll stop. You'll stop and ask for some help. Ask them to come into your life and to lead you and guide you. So, Gary, this is Sharon Green. You're listening to the Rose of Sharon Show. We're getting ready to go to commercial break. And when we come back, we're going to continue fighting the good fight of faith. Attention, pastors, ministry leaders, and nonprofits. Did you know that most leaders cannot describe their ideal leadership environment? Do you currently have systems in place to facilitate a growth environment? Imagine having a ministry or organization with the tools and strategies that are guaranteed to improve leadership awareness in your staff and volunteers. Stop and imagine no longer. Alley Thief's Consulting Group was established just for you, those who dare to lead from the inside out. Allow the truth LA Thief leadership to meet your training, speaking, and coaching needs at www.alethiefsconsultinggroup.com. That's A-L-E-T-H-E-S consultinggroup.com. Or give us a call at 240-245-0503. Or email us at alethiefsleader at gmail.com. That's A-L-E-T-H-E-S leader at gmail.com. Too many times we find ourselves wearing masks to cover our true selves. Girl in the Glass is an empowerment group that supports you in honoring the person you are meant to be. Go to www.girlintheglass.net and learn to trust, receive, and believe in your ability to live in your truth. Visit www.girlintheglass.net today. It's 6.42 p.m. Time for Steve Plato and his son Dylan to do the dishes. They talk about everything from the yuckiness of girls to the awesomeness of his soccer team. Sometimes they don't talk at all. Then, hey, the dreaded (laughs) splash fight. It's dad o'clock, and it's the best time of the day. Because the smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. Call 877-4DAD-411 or visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. Today might be the day I drop out of school. But you might be able to stop me. With United Way, you could tutor me, be my mentor, or volunteer to just read with me. There are tons of ways people like you can help kids like me stay in school. Make me a success, not a statistic. Take the pledge to volunteer now at unitedway.org. Brought to you by United Way and the Ad Council. Sharon Green, and you're listening to the Rose of Sharon Show on the Survival Radio Christian Network. And tonight we are talking about fighting the good fight of faith. And so as I was speaking earlier, I don't think I ever finished my thought about um, teaching the Word of God like you're in school. I know I talked about, let me see, spirit gives life to spirit, and flesh gives life to flesh, and therefore... It is my belief, actually, what I heard, what I received, is that clearly that don't work. And so now I've taken a different approach. Lord Gay has given me a different approach. And, of course, if anybody listens to the show, you know it's a direct approach, not beating around the bush. We're going straight to the word. What does it say? What does the word say? And so now as we're fighting, it's just in the natural, you know, we have weapons, we have armor and vehicles and mortars and all kinds of different technology and devices that we use. 
They're all external, and they cause a lot of damage. A gun was never meant to bless anybody. It was always meant to cause harm to another person. And so when we fight, we don't fight like that. Everything we need for our fight is on the inside of you. Because the kingdom of heaven does suffer violence, not the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, the place, the place that God has desired that as in heaven, as in earth, that we have the garden of Eden in the earth, that we see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living because we believe. And so we fight a real enemy who does not want us to know our inheritance. He does not want us to receive everything that was laid up for us. He wants us to continue to struggle and look to natural solutions. And natural solutions can't get rid of spiritual problems. A spiritual solution can cause all kinds of natural goodness to exist. And so as we fight and we recognize that, we have to recognize how to fight. Jesus himself in John 18 and 36 says, my, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight. So he didn't fight. Why are we fighting? Our kingdom is not of this world. You are an ambassador. You represent a place that's not here. You represent the kingdom of heaven and the earth. You are the best with all rights and authority and privileges. All your provisions come from where you came from. All your instructions come from where you came from. Everything that you need pertaining to life and godliness is already on the inside of you has been provided from where you have come from. So as you represent Christ, as we represent Christ in the earth, on assignment for God, that he may be made large in the earth, that man may come to know him through our lives. When you recognize that, you don't have the same concerns as other people. You just don't. You just don't. So before I go on, I had a, I remember the conversation that I had with a good friend of mine. I love this lady. Um, I haven't known her all that long, but I can say she's a good friend. She's sincere. Her heart is pure. And so she was asking me some questions about the word. And for whatever reason, somebody told her I was going to tell her, well, go read the Bible. No, I don't get advice. I go read the Bible. And I told her, I said, where do you get that from? I never told you go read the Bible. I may say go find a solution. Or sometimes, you know, I'll look at a four, but more, I'll say go find a solution. Find a solution, not go read the Bible. You can Google the solution. <laughs> and it'll work out. But she said, no, I, I need you to teach me how, like, for instance, if I was in water and I couldn't swim, and then you would give me the instructions on how to swim, because, you know, you wouldn't let me drown. You, you know, you would... Said, throw me in a life vest or something to help me learn how to swim. And I said, no, Wendy, wife, I'm talking about you. <laughs> I said, no, baby, I let you drown. <laughs> and when I said it, I heard myself say it, like, wow, I meant that too. I let you drown. And I told her why. Because I can't be your God. You have to learn to trust God. So when you get his word, you have to learn to trust him that his word is true. It can't be true because I said it. It has to be true because it is true. It has to be the right thing to do because it is the right thing to do. So as I said that, I said, wow, you know, that's really true. I wouldn't let you drown. I wouldn't just be jumping in and getting all wet and all messed up because you done fell in the water. <laughs> and that's not selfish. I would not never let her drown. But I, I'm losing that to say that you have to trust God. You can't wait to see something in order to believe it. The sad thing about when the church unifies, and it shall, not all of it, but a lot of people in leadership positions and ministry will see, voluntarily or involuntarily, the need to come together and be unified. And the sad thing about that is when unity happens and signs and wonders follow those who believe and God is made large, finally, in the body, the church will be the one showing us surprise. Christians will be the ones showing up not expecting God to be big in the earth. And we, all our assignment is to believe, not to see. Because when you believe, you shall see. But you have to see it first. See it in your heart. See it in your spirit. Okay, well, let me keep going. See it in your spirit. So when you know who you are, then you know 
the equipment that you have on board. And so the most important product, person that you have equipping you, the power of God is the spirit of God. So when you got saved, did you just receive Holy Spirit in your mind or did you get him in your heart? Here's Acts 17 that says that in the message Bible. Did you just get Holy Spirit in your mind or did you receive him in your heart? Because that's the power of God. It's like having a car and you don't have an engine. You have a car, you have the body, it looks good, everybody's praising you, but you can't go nowhere because you don't have an engine in it. And so now you have the engine. You're trying to activate the engine. Get it in your heart. Pray in your heavenly language. Pray in your heavenly language until it just feels like a natural conversation that you're having with God. Pray past how you feel. Pray past how you try to figure out what you're saying. Don't try to figure out what you're saying. Don't And don't tell me it don't happen like that. I know. <laughs> I know. You just got to keep doing it. Trust God enough that his word is true. And he says, build yourself up on your most holy faith. Pray in your heavenly language. Jude 20. He knew what he was talking about. Over in Ephesians 6, put on the full armor of God. Be equipped. Matter of fact, it never tells you to take it off. No one in the Bible says take it off. And if you get rid of all of them, I might do that before I, hang, before I get off the show today. Go to Ephesians 6 and show you how it's a military phrase. He talks about the military line in the Bible. No soldier goes to war at their own expense. No soldier engaged in warfare is concerned about the affairs of this life, that she may please him who enlisted her as a soldier as we fight the good fight of faith. Because you're at war. It's a real enemy. But you fight by believing because the more you believe, the more the enemy is out of order. He will not be a normal part of your life. He'll be out of order. So I got some questions for you. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Now, I know that's John 14, but I'm saying that. <laughs> this is Sharon saying that. Just like you can say that. You can say that to people who question your faith, the people who look at you when you are a little different and you don't get excited and upset when things happen. When you no longer stop celebrating every time somebody gives a testimony of what the Lord did for me, and you sit there and don't celebrate, and they look at you like you're crazy, but then you respond with, "What? Well, why didn't you expect it to happen? Why didn't you expect to be healed? Why didn't you expect to get the position you've been speaking about? Why didn't you expect that your husband's going to show up and be a great, awesome man of God? Why don't you expect the things that you pray for to manifest in your life? Clearly we don't. Clearly, we celebrate stuff like we had no idea it was going to happen. But as you grow and you start recognizing who you are, because the more you celebrate by sight, which is not pleasing to God, which nobody in heaven is celebrating, the more you give leverage to the enemy in your life. But by faith, we live. By faith, we walk. By faith, we speak. By faith. It's how we do this thing called life. So let me finish asking my question. Do you not believe, I'm actually saying one, that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works as he is, so are we. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. For he dwells with you and is in you, John 14 and 17. But you are not in the flesh but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his, Romans 8 and 9. I believe you have the spirit of Christ. So walk right, allow, allow him to lead you because he dwells in you. Romans 8 and 11, but the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life, has also given life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. He has given life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. You can't die again. You transition. 
Don't hang up. Don't get off. Cut me off. You cannot die again. Death is the enemy of God. First Corinthians fifteen twenty six. The enemy. You have been set free from the laws of sin and death. All those things that cause death. You have been set free from that. You transition out of that body, out of that dirt, and you immediately go in the presence of life. You of of God. You continue on. You transition. Death is the enemy. You have life. You have been given eternal life. Life does not take a break because somebody arranged a funeral. Life is still ongoing. See, we can believe God now and have rewards later because although we didn't see him, we know he exists. We know his word is true. We're faithful as promised because he's faithful as promised. We can believe that now and we transition in his presence because you will have to give an account for your time in that body. You will have to give an account for every idle word. And when you recognize that you have to give an account, you will stop being in agreement with people because you don't want to be peculiar. You just won't do it because you know I'm going to have to give an account to my Lord and Savior, which is not you. <laughs> so you got to see people know let every man be a liar. I don't care how many shows, how much money they have, how much, how important they look. Like I just said, one of the biggest churches where I live, sure they got plenty of money, loaded. It looks like they're doing great things. I've never met a single person on that church that's mature, not one. They're greatly entertained. We have these things that we do. We come together. But what are we getting out of it? How am I stretching? How am I growing? If everything I got to talk about is me, then I know my life can't be all that great if I can't talk about the goodness of the Lord and the land of the living. First Corinthians 3 and 16. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? And then James 4 and 5. Or do you think that the scripture say, says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealousy, jealously, the Spirit of God, because God's name is jealous. I like to talk about Exodus 34 and 14, which says, you, Don't you better not worship no other God besides me. <laughs> I know that's my interpretation, but that's what it says. You should not worship another God besides me. I'm a jealous God. My name is jealous. And his jealousy extends to his love of you. Like he's going to let somebody mess with his prized possession, his people, his children. But the spirit of God that's inside of you is jealous. It longs for the Father. It longs for life because it doesn't know death. It doesn't know evil. God has no evil to give you. It sees it because his hands are tied. Father God cannot go against his word. He gave this place to us to have dominion, to replenish, to subdue. He gave it to us. The heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he's given to the sons of men. It belongs to us. He can't go against his will. He told you whatever you bind is bound. Whatever you loose is loose. And so long as you're waiting for him to do something, because he is at rest, Genesis 2, 2 and 3, he's at rest. As long as you wait for him to do something that he's already done, instead of believing that it's done, taking it by faith and expecting it in your life, because although you don't see it, does not mean it does not exist. Stop putting my father on delay. He is the God of right now. He does not have time. He's not waiting for time. If anything, he's waiting for you to grow up and to believe that what he has in store for you, you will be able to handle. He's not like the prodigal son's father. He will not release into his children's hands things that they cannot, things that we cannot handle. He will not give us a million dollars and you can't take care of 20 because it will become a curse to you. But it's already yours. It's already yours. So I'm stretching you, and I think about it. The things in life that my father has laid up for me, why don't I see them? Who am I giving my attention to? Because an excuse, I want an excuse to be a problem for you. <laughs> I want an excuse to be a problem. I want an excuse of why things are the way they are to be a problem. Not that you have to run out and do anything. You just need the final word on what he said about it and just meditate, believe it. Speak it, expect it, because you've been giving yourself an excuse long enough now. You got a cold, that's an excuse. Sickness is a curse. It should come out just like that. Sickness is a curse. Curse. Jesus became a curse for us. 
in, what is it, Galatians 3 and 13. He became a curse because everything that's in Deuteronomy 28, 15 and below, all the curses, he became that for us. He took it to the cross. He paid the price. He did not leave anything on the cross for you to bear. I know we want to go to the cross if I can get on the cross in your place. No, none of that foolishness. He did it all. It's a done deal. When your children come to you, they're excited. They're not coming to you like, I'm just so grateful to be your child. I'm just so grateful that I was born into this family. I'm so unworthy. No, your children don't do that. No, and God don't want us doing that either. He wants us to be excited about being his called out. Children, call out of darkness into this marvelous light, into the kingdom of his son that he loves. He wants us to be excited. He wants us to be confident in who we are in him. He wants us to reverence the thought of him and not people. And so we got nine minutes left. If you have the desire to call in or ask questions, please do so. While you're contemplating on doing so, <laughs> this Wednesday, we have our Wednesday morning prayer call at 6 a.m. Because we fight by prayer. Because we fighting again next week. You're going to round three. How we fight? We fight with prayer. Now, if you don't pray or if you're praying, doubt and unbelief, you might as well just don't pray. No, I shouldn't say that. I take that back. I apologize. No, keep praying. Keep praying. Keep praying until you get it, get it right. Just keep doing it. Keep talking to him. He'll help you. He'll help you. He'll convict you back. He'll remind you. I already did that for you. I already did that for you, too. I already did that for you. <laughs> He'll remind you. So I apologize for that. But the number for the prayer call is 424-203-8400. in the pound key. That's the number for the prayer call Wednesday at 6 a.m. So call in. And don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't be afraid to ask questions. That's how we grow. You don't know everything. Your life does not have the authority to prove God. I don't care what you've been through or who's been through what. Your life doesn't have the authority to prove God. Your life only has the authority to reveal him. He wants you to reveal him to the world. That's your assignment. But the stuff you went through, that can't prove God because he set you up a peace before you got here. He set you up a problem. So we have to fix that and expect him. There are no problems in heaven. So you set your mind on things above, there are no problems. Many of the afflictions of the righteous does not mean all righteous people have afflictions. It does not mean that. In me, you may have peace. In this world, you shall have tribulations. In me, you may have peace of faith. In this world, you shall have tribulations of sight. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the words of the testimony and did not love their lives to death. They did not love their lives to death. They decided to lay down their lives and pick up their cross and follow him and be as he is. And they overcame him. Who was they and who was him? Go look at Revelation 12 and 10. Find out who was they and who was him. Because they is not any problems. Because and the Lamb, the blood and the Lamb, the Lamb took away the sins of the world. So your problem got sent in it somewhere. Trust, it does. And so let's get ourselves off of our mind and let's fight. Next week, I'm, you know, I'm taking this a little slower than I actually planned. Because we have, you got to know who you are in order to fight. Because nobody goes to battle expecting to lose. As an athlete, I never walked on the court. Now, one basketball court, like, hmm, we're going to lose today. I could care less who was playing. Yes, I lost a few games. I lost some a few games by a lot in some cases. Not that many, though, praise God. But I have. But I never went on the court expecting to win. It didn't bother me, or I never gave up before the end of the game. Because no, nobody goes out there, and I could care less who was playing. So the same mentality that I had when I played basketball for over 30 years, when I showed up, this is what I was thinking. Somebody ain't in the play. <laughs> exactly. I've never said it. I was not arrogant. Externally, I wasn't arrogant internally either because I was a good team player. But I knew how hard I worked at it. I knew my heart's desire as a team. Now, it's just somebody trying to get points. As a team, I knew that from the inside out. And I always said somebody ain't going to play. And trust me, somebody did not play. They didn't. 
And so now, now in this position to be able to make impact in the lives of others, everybody is playing. Everybody is playing. Everybody wins. Everybody gets a crown because we're in the fight. We're in the race. I ain't trying to do nothing by myself. I need people in the body with me because it's my body. It's my, we all in the body, so I get to talk about the body. I ain't got to know you. I get to talk about you. I get to catch your words. I get to tell you what truth looks like. Whether you receive it or not, that is not my concern. I thank God that he has freed me from that. Whether you like what I'm saying or not, that is not my concern. I just get to speak life. He gets to do the work on your heart. The Holy Spirit is connecting to his word. And so if I got to pray you in a frenzy until you can't get any rest, until you believe the word of God, then, hey, got to stay up and pray, got to fast, until we believe the word of God, until we get excited about the kingdom and the earth, until we actually come together and be unified in a one accord, rightly dividing the word, and no longer settling, then that's what I just got to do. And I pray that you have that same hunger and thirst on the inside of you to make it happen. So I don't even know if I gave you the number. Does anybody want to call us, 347-237-4648? 4648, and then just hit one. You can ask anything you want to. But before we get off, you can still call me. I'm going to keep talking. But before we get off, you really have to know how to see God in order to fight because when you really see him, when you know we talk to I just got to talk about him dwelling in you. So he has, he dwells in you. So you know he's in you. He's always with you 24-7. You can stop asking him to show up and come in and sit down and get up and go away and brighten up the room because he's with you all the time. <laughs> so you can stop talking about him like he's far off. But when you really know that God is love, he's not trying to give you love. He can't take love from you. He just is pure, unconditional love, all good, all perfect. It says love corrects. Why does love correct? Love corrects because love loves you enough to want to see a better you, to get the best out of you. People who don't correct you, who don't tell you the truth, that's not love. They, they, that's hate. If I know you're going off track, if I know you're about to go over a cliff, and I say, well, you know, I ain't going to say nothing to them because they make it mad at me, and then you go over the cliff, that's not love. Love is telling you the truth whether you want to hear it or not. But I'm not going to ram it down your throat. But if I'm led, he, the Holy Spirit will lead you. He'll lead you to tell truth to strangers. And your family, if they don't want to listen, because they're the main ones, because they remember Pookie and Boo Boo and Shishi and what all them little funny names that you get when you're a baby. They remember that person. They remember the person that drank and got high. They remember that person. They don't remember the person that's loving Christ, the person who's growing spiritually. They just know the old you. So sometimes our family and those closest to us take a long time before they recognize that you actually are growing up in all things into Christ. It ain't your job to prove it to them. It's your assignment to be consistent, to be consistent in your walk, to be consistent in your talk. You can't ram Jesus down nobody's throat. I'm not trying to ram him down yours. I'm just telling you the truth. What does the word have to say about it? And then ask yourself, why don't I believe? God says you were healed, First Peter 2 and 24. You were healed, but you always sick. Your kids sick, everybody's sick. He said you were healed, past tense. So if God says that you were healed, it should bother you to call him a liar. That should bother you. First John 5 and 5 and 10. You don't believe the testimony that he's given of his son. 5, 10, and 11. So I don't believe the testimony that God has given of his son, that Jesus really went to the cross, that he really took all sickness and infirmities, and he became a curse for me, that he did all that for me, that he gave me the abundant life, that I'm hidden so deep inside of him that the world's way of doing what it does can't touch me. I don't believe that. That's your homework. (laughs) Figure it out. Think about it. Meditate on it. Why don't I believe? Help me with my unbelief. So when you believe the word, you get it in your heart, it will start coming out your mouth, and you will see all things good and perfect in your life. That's my prayer for you on tonight. I pray that you got something out of this. You need to reach out to me. I'm on Google. Me go to YouTube. Find that important. You'll find me. Go to my Facebook page. Anyway, I just want to tell you that I love you, but God loves you more. 
Have a wonderful blessed week. I look forward to doing this again next week, same time, Sunday, 9 p.m. This is Sharon Green. You listen to the Rose of Sharon Show on the Survival Radio Christian Network. Have a wonderfully awesome blessed night. Tune in next Sunday at 9 p.m. Eastern Time for more of the Rose of Sharon Show with our host, Sharon Green, on the Survival Radio Christian Network.